Dr. McCarthy, could you please tell us a little bit about the Annie E. Casey Foundation's work with the National Conference of State Legislatures over the years? I know we've had a, a nice long partnership. Since 2002, uh, the Casey Foundation has partnered with the National Conference of State Legislatures uh, as one of our most important policy partners. Uh, we've uh, done a lot of work with NCSL around family economic success. And in that work, we've funded legislative summits where we've actually engaged 350 legislators um, over the years, uh, coming in teams of eight to 10 uh, different states coming together and talking about how they can forward policies that will improve the economic prospects of the families uh, in their states. Uh, 36 states have participated uh, and we've seen really interesting policy change, productive change in 28 of those states over that period of time. In the last uh, three years or so, we've expanded our partnership with NCSL to include a uh, focus on child welfare and a focus in uh, juvenile justice where we've worked on issues such as uh, reducing the use of solitary confinement, for example. Um, we have uh, also uh, continued to work with NCSL on family economic uh, success issues. And then most recently, we've begun to work with NCSL on how to promote a two-generation strategy to improving outcomes for kids. Yes. Thank you. Um, so kind of building on that, um, what are some of the foundation's current priorities and initiatives specifically related to juvenile justice? Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about JDAI, the Juvenile Detention mm -hmm. Alternatives Initi Initiative, and closing youth prisons. Um, you mentioned reducing solitary, but just to, just to get you started, those are some of the sure. priorities we'd right. love to hear about currently. So in our juvenile justice work, there are four areas where we're focusing a lot of attention. One is our continued work with reducing the reliance on detention for young people who are charged with a crime but have not yet had their hearing. We've been involved in that work for 25 years. We're in over 300 different jurisdictions around the country with an average reduction in detention population in those jurisdictions of 43%. So that continues to be a priority as we roll that out across the nation. Our second area of priority is to reduce the numbers of children who go into youth prisons, who go into institutions because of their involvement uh, with the juvenile justice system. And we've worked with a number of states to reduce that pipeline uh, into those uh, juvenile uh, facilities. Uh, most recently, we have uh, announced a major effort to literally close youth prisons. Now again, we're talking about the large, very secure uh, oriented uh, command and control kind of institutions mm -hmm. that we found uh, don't work for young people. We recognize some young people may need some secure care, but not in these large prison-like environments. And finally, we've also begun to work on reforming the probation system so we get uh, better results for young people who are uh, sent on to probation. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and now just kind of jumping ahead a bit to um, a recent essay, essay that you authored. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Kids Count essay and, and um, maybe mention a little bit about Kids Count in general? Sure. Thank you. Uh, each year we publish a data report that uh, compares the states on how children in each state uh, are doing across 16 different indicators of child well-being, health and education and their economic circumstances, et cetera. In addition, periodically throughout the year, we'll issue policy reports where we make recommendations about problems that families and children may be facing. Most recently, we came out with a report called Shared Sentence. And we were looking at the issue of children who have a parent who is incarcerated and what the impact of the incarceration is on the child. And we found that when uh, adults are incarcerated, when parents are incarcerated, um, let me start that over. We found that when parents are incarcerated, children often bear a lot of the brunt of the negative outcomes. They're more likely to have problems in school. Their economic situation deteriorates. They're more likely to have mental health problems. And we make a number of recommendations that we believe states can put in place to reduce the risk to the children, who after all, after all are completely innocent in this situation, reduce the risk to children when a parent is incarcerated. Things like encouraging courts to ensure that the parent is 
placed in a facility that is not so far from the child that the child loses in complete contact uh, with the parent. Helping the parent while the parent is incarcerated to learn how to become a better parent once they're released. Helping parents who are released find work, find a place to live, and be reunited with their uh, child. That sounds like a wonderful report. So you said it is available and our members could find it on the um, Annie E. Casey website. We have a range of reports that are available on the Annie E. Casey Foundation website. Our Kids Count reports are all available. Our policy reports are available, as well as specific reports about areas such as child welfare, juvenile justice, education, income security, health, et cetera. Wonderful. And we at NCSL could even link to some of those on our website so our members, if they're on our juvenile justice page, or, you know, can. That kind of would be stuff. terrific. So, yeah. right? Okay. Um, well, finally, I think just to sort of tie it into to our members and moving forward, um, I'd like to ask, what do you think state legislators need to know from you and from your foundation to help in their efforts to reform juvenile justice in their states moving forward? In many ways, state legislators have one of the most critical roles to play in making sure our juvenile justice system does what it's supposed to do. The public is very clear. They want young people who get in trouble with the law to receive services so they're less likely to reoffend. They want the community safe, and they want to see young people be put back on the right track. Legislators play a huge role in determining whether or not that happens. It begins with how the system is funded. If the system is funded in a way that encourages incarceration, then you're more likely going to see incarceration. If the system is set up so that young people with relatively minor charges who don't represent a threat to the community are incarcerated, then you're spending a whole lot of money for a young person who is not going to, necess is not going to be uh, successful coming out of that institution, and you're not really protecting uh, public safety. So the legislature can look at the structure of financing, which programs they finance, which young people are uh, eligible to be uh, in incarcerated. And the, the legislature has a huge responsibility to provide oversight to the executive branch when it administers these institutions to make sure that for those young people who are incarcerated, the institution is safe, it's secure, and that the young person is getting the programs that uh, they need in order to be successful. The simple most important thing a legislature can do is to ask himself or ask herself, are we getting what we're paying for from the juvenile justice system? In other words, look at the results. And if you have the institutions where 75 to 85 percent of young people are rearrested or reincarcerated within two or three years, you have to ask the question of whether or not that's a good investment. When you're spending anywhere from $85,000 a year to $250,000 a year to incarcerate one child, is that a good investment? So I would just ask that legislatures, legislators hold juvenile correctional systems to the same standards they would hold any other state investment. Are you getting what you're paying for? And I would argue you're not. Thank you.